How do I love thee? Let me count the waves. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. We're feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to youth, put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a the love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Friends, does that title remind you of a song? I think there is a song by that name. I long for the touch of your hand. I'm not going to sing it for you, because not very long ago, I called up a friend of mine on his birthday, and I thought that I would surprise him. And so when he answered, I began singing, happy birthday to you, and on and on and on. And lo and behold, when I finished singing, the voice at the other end said, I'm afraid you have the wrong party. <laughs> and I said, I'm very sorry. And he said, it's all right. You sure do need the practice. <laughs> you know, my angel has been hanging around me so long with my poor singing that they no longer allow him in the choir of angels. We've chosen this particular title because it is one of three degrees of communication. When do we begin to enter in communication with anyone? There are three ways. First of all, we would never know that anyone loved us unless he told us so. Speech is the first communication of love. As soon as we hear a person speak, we know something about him. Speech is the summation of a soul, all that it has been, all that it is, and all that it will ever be. Just turn over the pages of some great writer of the ancient past, Plato, for example. You know something about him just by listening to his words. We hear someone speak and we say, oh, he's a kind man. He's a cruel man. Or he's selfish. That's the first degree of intimacy. Now there's a second. It is vision. We not only want to hear words of love, we want to see them born on human lips. We want to see the flash of an eye, and the earnestness of a visage. And so love, therefore, must not only be heard, but it must be seen. It was therefore natural to have a development in this industry from radio to television. Radio is the Old Testament. We hear about love. Television is the New Testament. We hear it and we see it. But is that all that love can do? There is still one other degree of communication. And that is touch. The ancients believed that there were certain nerves, for example, that ran from the the finger of the hand up to the heart. That's why rings are worn on certain fingers, according to their judgment. But a touch puts us in immediate contact with another. 
And this is the last and complete communication of all love. Now that's why in theology, I'm not going to develop the theology of it, but just to recall it. If divine love were ever to reveal himself completely, he had to go through these, these three stages. We would never know anything about, for example, the love of God unless he told us so. In the Old Testament is the speech of God. Where we hear such words as, if your sins are as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. If they are as red as crimson, they shall be made white as wool. But that was not enough. If man was completely to understand love, love had to become enfleshed, incarnate. And that happened. God was seen in a thousand different attitudes of love. We're embarrassed to pick out which best revealed that love visible. He that seeth me seeth the Father. But the depths would not be sounded unless there was touch. So he put his arms around children. And Thomas put finger into hand, and hand into side, to be healed of his doubt. So there was nothing more that love could do. Spoke, was seen, and was touched. Now, out of these intimacies, we're going to choose one. And for what purpose? for a purpose you would not generally suspect from the title. We hear a great deal today about civil rights, social justice, conflict of races and classes and peoples. And we try to meet all of these conflicts with abstractions. That's not enough. By the touch of a, your hand, we are pleading for a new kind of contact. You have to have the right contacts in the world. And the only way to solve all of these problems of the conflict of races and classes is by the sense of touch. The touch of your hand. Now let us, let us see what touch does in relationship to this problem. In relationship to conflicts, touch changes the anonymous into the personal. So long as we stay away from people, we can call them a they. In other words, it means very little to them. We, we ask, for example, what do the Negroes want? What do the Jews want? What do the Catholics want? What do the Muslims want? We group them. They're anonymous, and we put ourselves almost in the position of being the dispensers of all privileges. It's easy to hate people in groups. How often, for example, when women are out shopping and they're, they're, there's a bargain counter and they rush toward one another, toward the bargain counter, and uh, elbowing and pushing until you recognize that the one you pushed was your best friend or a next door neighbor. And how the expression completely changes. Oh, happy to see you. What did touch do? It changed that person from being someone of a group into a person. Uh, take, for example, automobile driving. Just as soon as a person gets enclosed in a ton and a half of steel, he changes his personality. And so 
We grunt and growl and scream and howl at anyone who cuts us off. Because they're impersonal. I heard of a man and woman who were riding in a car one day and a, the husband was driving. And another car cut him off. And he said to his wife, wouldn't you know, a woman driver. When they got up to the stoplight, she said to him, that wasn't a woman, that was a man driving. He said, I know, but I bet his mother taught him. <laughs> so, when, thanks, Angel. <laughs> so, when you, when you uh, consider any class or race as a totality, it's easy to hate them. But once you begin to touch them, then they become very, very different. I believe that there are certain classes of people, diseases rather, diseased people that you can love only just by touching them. That is one of the reasons why if this problem of the conflict of races is to be solved, those who are presently talking about them as they must go down to them, move among them, touch the children, buy them candy, Go into their homes. Share a little blessing with them. We move into the inner city. Why is it that in one country of the world there has been a race of untouchables? Why untouchable? Why couldn't you touch certain people? Because if you ever touch them, you get to love them. We never find people unlovable once we really get very close to them. And so this is the first, first remedy for our class hatred, the sense of touch, of going down to them, being with them, rubbing shoulders with them. And the second thing that touch does, I don't know, maybe I should have told you all the things it did at first and then go through them, but this gives the, the angel a chance to function and to fulfill all the rules and ordinances of Angel Union 68532. <laughs> touch also serves this purpose. The purpose of infection. But the infection of what? The infection of goodness. Yes, I know there's such a thing as the infection of evil. So certain diseases are quarantined. We have to stay away from certain plagues and infections. But when we touch people, there can also be the contagion of goodness. There will be something good that will go out to us, from us, and there'll be something good that will come from them. Goodness works both ways. It's a kind of exchange. Remember the, uh, the story of the woman who, in a great crowd, that was pressing about our Lord, said within herself, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. Just touch the hem. Touch. 
It was hope, like a sick patient has when the doctor enters the room. And what did he say? He turned around and said to the woman, I, I felt a power go out from me. Goodness, healing, pass from himself into others. As we then move in the inner city, among the poor, and go down to them, we infect them with love. In this beautiful communication of kindliness, the poor always have their hands out like that. Open. And those who have another kind of goodness have their hands like this, the giving. And they meet. And one hand, as it were, infects another. Babies generally have their hands closed. Little fists. They come into a world ready for possession. But when they die, their hands are open. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I've heard it said. Just ask anyone to stretch out his hand and you can tell something of his character. No, I don't know whether this is true or not, but at any rate, I must tell you that I got started. They say that if a man reaches out his hand and he holds it like that, fingers closed together, and there's no, no cup in his hand, or not much of a cup to hold anything. He's tight, he's avaricious. I don't know, try it sometime. Want to send me a dime for the, for the poor of the world? How did you put out your hand? That way or this way? <laughs> but there is... The healing will come from love. Now let me try to illustrate this in another way. Negatively. And I think we'll call it... I'm going to write it on the board so you will know it. We're going to call it lack love. Just one word. What happens when there's lack love? No touch of any kind. No radiation of goodness. No infection of mercy. Well, let us apply it to children. Some years ago, there was a study made of 10 orphan asylums in the United States. 10. Only one child out of all that were in the 10 institutions that was brought in under the age of one survived to the age of two. Only one out of ten orphan asylums. Why? There was no touch of the hand. There was no loving. It is said that a mother has to pick up her child many times a day. Maybe that's one of the reasons why babies cry. Tradition has it that I did nothing but cry for two years first two years of my mortal life. But in another, another test of lack love, and this test was made in New York City, children were grouped into two different classes. One was called the nursery. The other was called the foundling. Now let not the words be associated with any, any particular thing. These were just nomenclatures. In the nursery, all of the children were cared for by the mothers. In the foundling, there was only one nurse for every 10 to 12 child, children. 
so that the, in the nursery there was mother care and love. In the foundling there was very little of it. At the end of two years, the doctors reported that the children in the foundling could neither walk nor eat by themselves. And one doctor described them as apathetic idiots. At the end of five years, all of the children in the nursery were alive and 39% of the foundlings died. That happens to children, don't you think it could happen to poor people? Where there's lack love? There was a test made on, on monkeys in which young monkeys that were born were divided into two classes. And one little group of little monkeys were, had nobody to care for them at all. And the other group of monkeys were given a mechanical mother monkey. And this mechanical mother monkey was electrically heated. And when a monkey would jump up in its arms, the arms would mechanically move and embrace the little one. What happened? All of the little monkeys that had this mechanical mother and were warmed by its seeming affection became, they became normal monkeys. But those other monkeys, I wish we had Bert Lahr here to say it, became the craziest of all monkeys because they lacked love. Why are many young people today aggressive? They're aggressive because they've never received love. A study made of juvenile delinquents in England proved that the delinquents that came from divorced parents or there was no love of father and mother were guilty of the most serious crimes and also repeated their crimes more than the others. So the touch of the hand then brings us not only in communion with with those that are in need of love, but it also infects them with our goodness and our kindness and our mercy. And I had another, I have two minutes and uh, 11 seconds to go. Now I had another point to tell you, and I know this is the one now that'll make you curious because I'm not telling it to you. I don't have time, I can't start it. And so the problem is, you see in television, what do you do in two hours, in two minutes, and, uh, or one minute and 58 seconds? You get very nervous and you say, oh, what, uh, what am I going to do with the time? But we'll save the other point, point for you. I merely want now to suggest to you that the problem of race and class will be solved in part by settling our abstract questions of rights, but it will be settled practically and concretely by love. And the burden of love falls on those who have. After all, for example, God loves me. There's no reason in the world why God should love me. Absolutely none. Now, I don't know whether you think you're very lovable or not, but probably in very honest moments you admit that you too are not very lovable. But God loves you. Just as he loves me. Well, why does he love me? Why does he love you? Since there's nothing very lovable in us. He loves us because he puts some of his love into us. His love into us. And that's why we're supremely and divinely lovable. So down to the inner city. Touch children, touch people. Live with them. Mingle with them. Do the divine thing. Put a little love into them. And everyone will become lovable.
Bye now. And God love you.